So what's behind Trump's assault on free trade? Is he really a protectionist? Or is there more to Trump's trade war than people are letting on? All of this coming right up. The question is that the motion be agreed to. I call the Prime Minister. We would give a referendum on whether to remain or leave the European Union. I will never send troops anywhere in a mission of that kind. Very pleased to know what they think they're doing. I think they're all insane. Ladies and gents, welcome to another episode of Hidden Perspective. This is Rob Greco. Okay, so this is the second part in the US China trade war series. If you haven't listened to the first part, I do recommend going back, otherwise, this isn't going to make sense. I had a friend come up to me a few weeks ago saying that they accidentally played the UBI series from episode three not realizing that there were two episodes before that, and naturally it didn't make sense. So this will be highly sequential, so I do recommend listening to them in order so you can get a full understanding of the issue. So in the previous episode, we looked at the background to trade, the details of the US-China trade war itself, and we also took a look at the pro-free trade arguments. This episode, we're going to take a look and examine what exactly is behind Trump's view on the US-China trade war. So for starters, Trump's a bit of a confusing figure when it comes to trade. We can't really pin him down. While the mainstream media's view is that Trump is a protectionist, in other words, someone who wants to erect trade barriers to protect domestic industry and workers, there's so much more that they're missing. For example, he hates the comparison to Herbert Hoover, who is a hugely protectionist U.S. president. Let's take a listen. The Wall Street Journal says that you are running as, quote, the most anti-trade candidate since Herbert Hoover. Okay, so here's the story. First of all, the Wall Street Journal was bought for $5 billion. It's now worth $500 million, okay? They don't have to tell me what to do. As you just heard, he clearly gets irked and defensive about the Herbert Hoover comparison. This is something that Steve Moore also tells us in his book, Trumponomics. Trump would always say, I can't believe people think I'm a protectionist. I'm a businessman. Do you not think that I appreciate the value of free trade? But in any case, let's assume that Trump is a protectionist. Is there any merit to this point of view? Well, if this is the case, the first point that you'd make is that Trump is trying to reindustrialize America by reorienting the global supply chain away from China and bringing it back to the States in order to bring back US factory jobs. Let's take a listen to Trump's former chief strategist, Steve Bannon, on this point. What Donald Trump has done in less than two years against the second law of thermodynamics right? The immutable law of the rise of China. Right. What he's done is reorient the entire world's supply chain away from China. And this is going to have economic growth opportunities that are going to be incredible. And he's done that kind of single-handedly against, against the fighting of the, the corporatist lobby, the fighting of the Wall Street Investor Relations Department, etc. So that's why I think it's really heroic. So that's the general strategy of reorienting the global supply chain away from China and bringing some of that back to the States. So the first point to note in all of this is that the claim of US deindustrialization is absolutely true. For example, the total number of US manufacturing jobs peaked in the year 1980. There was an absolutely remarkable drop-off in US manufacturing jobs in 2001, which coincidentally was the year that China joined the WTO. Steve Bannon attributes the slowdown in economic growth to the deindustrialization which took place as soon as China joined the WTO. Let's take a listen. Average compounded growth of the United States of America from 1946, the end of World War II, to 2000 was 3.5%. Okay? It's the reason we became a superpower. That economic engine that was unlocked and grew every year at 3.5% through good times and bad, on average. Yep. Since China joined the World Trade Organization, sure, it's, it's when they joined, they got most favored nation, the growth of the United States is 1.9%. Yep. 
Okay, 1.9%. And it, it, there's a lot of factors to that, but the central beating heart of it is China. Mm-hmm. That's what, because we deindustrialized. We sent, we sent our manufacturing over there. Now, although Bannon concedes that there are many factors to this, economists will send this argument right back and dismiss it entirely. Americans have been shedding U.S. manufacturing jobs as a percentage of total jobs ever since the end of World War II. So these job losses are nothing new. Any job losses are compensated not only by cheaper goods and a larger variety of goods, but also by new goods that will pop up in the economy as it continues to adjust. And so in general, the point that a slowdown in US economic growth has been attributed to deindustrialization doesn't hold water according to what the economists have to say. But what if these economists are missing something? What if China was different? An absolute bomb was dropped on the economics profession in 2016 when David Otter, an MIT economist, released his paper, China Shock. Now, although China Shock maintained that trade is still a win-win, it completely debunked the consensus view among economists that the effects of trade would be mild and easily adjustable for workers. Basically, China Shock showed that trade can have strong and concentrated effects on particular types of workers in particular types of regions, and that these displaced workers would find it difficult to find new jobs with their skill set because those new jobs would also be decimated by China shock. And so what made China different? Well, China differed from other countries due to its, one, sheer size, two, its import penetration, and three, the fact that it had a huge supply of surplus labor. I think there were 150 million peasants who moved from the countryside to the cities in order to start working in factories. It's just going to be difficult for US factories to compete with that scale of cheap labor. And because of this, China became the world's workshop. In the first 10 years since joining the WTO, its GDP quadrupled and its exports increased fivefold. In 2002, 409 million Chinese people were living below the international poverty line. By 2014, this went down to 18 million, less than 1.5% of its population. And at the same time, the US got screwed. U.S. manufacturing directly lost 560,000 jobs as a result of China shock. But indirectly, there were even more jobs lost, with people citing 2.5 million jobs lost indirectly due to China's introduction into the world trading system. The furniture industry was the worst hit, which completely decimated communities that relied upon furniture production. This led the lead economist on China Shock, David Otter, to say on a podcast that although we agree that free trade is still a good thing, it's still a win-win, we should rethink the rate at which we unwind trade protection to smooth these types of effects. Okay, so those are the facts regarding deindustrialization, as well as the China Shock paper written by MIT economist David Otter. But now you might be wondering, are Trump's tariffs working? Are factories actually reshoring back to the States? The evidence on this point is mixed. According to a survey conducted by the US Chamber of Commerce in China and Shanghai, 40% of respondents said they had considered or had actually relocated factories out of China, although most of those have been going to Southeast Asia. But it is having some effect in the States too. According to the reshoring initiative, there were 140,000 jobs that had reshored to the US in 2018, which is the year that Trump started imposing tariffs. But it's believed that most of these jobs were coming back due to the tax cuts and some deregulation measures that Trump had passed. Only 30,000 or so of those jobs had reshored back to the states because of Trump's tariffs. But still, you might be wondering, 30,000 jobs, that's, that's something. Well, yes and no. I mean, it is something, 
But when you consider how many jobs the US economy has created in that time, it's a small fraction of that. And in any case, any jobs that come back due to the tariffs need to be weighed against the costs in that situation, which in this case are the costs imposed by the tariffs, i.e. the costs on consumers through higher prices. Okay, so that's a recap of the reindustrialization point that people like Bannon and Trump have been making in favor of tariffs. The second big point that you hear floating around the media is that the U.S. needs to reduce its trade deficit of $500 billion. If you forgot what a trade deficit is, I mentioned it last time. It's basically that the U.S. buys $500 billion in goods more than China buys from the U.S. But as I touched on last time, this point about trade deficits being inherently wrong doesn't hold up. It's just a nonsense, mercantilist view of trade. There's nothing intrinsically wrong about a trade deficit. And just to recap why, there are three reasons. The first one being that the trade deficit is a deficit regarding merchandise goods. It doesn't include services like accounting and consulting services, which the US dominates over China. The second point is that the trade deficit is pretty much dollar for dollar offset by a capital account surplus the capital account being the buying and selling of assets. And the third point is that trade deficits have been strongly correlated with periods of strong economic growth and low unemployment. But something I didn't mention last time is that there could be something unusual about how large and for how long the US have had this trade deficit with China something simmering beneath the surface which has prevented trade adjustments to take place. Now, the obvious explanation for this is that the US has been racking up historically high levels of debt and the Chinese have been only too willing to buy this debt. But I think that's a side issue because there's something else that's been going on, which I'll get to a bit later on. So we'll just plant a flag here and note to self that something unusual about the trade deficit. What if Trump doesn't really believe in this idea of protection and, unsurprisingly, the mainstream media is missing something? What if Trump is in favor of free trade but has only started to impose tariffs to address China's trade violations? Here's Steve Bannon again. People have to understand the global economy, and I'm a nationalist, okay, but the, the, the health of the American economy is based on trade. Mm. You know, you know, populists and economic nationalists are not anti-trade. They're anti this radical concept of free trade when you're trading with a totalitarian mercantilist society. Right. We want, we, what Trump wants and what he said from day one is fair trade and reciprocity, okay, reciprocity. And I think now we're going to get down to it with China. You know, this thing is not going to, this thing is, is going to, China's going to have to understand that Donald Trump is never going to back down on this. Some of you might find this hard to believe, given the mainstream media view that Trump is a protectionist, but consider Trump's comments at the G7 meetup in Canada in 2018. Here's Steve Bannon again. President Trump, remember the G7, when he was lectured by his betters, Merkel and Macron on the first day, you know, about this whole thing about tariffs, right? He came back the next day for breakfast. And what Trump, you know, what Trump told, uh, told the, the G7, he said, okay, I thought about it last night. How about this? No tariffs. Absolutely no tariffs, but no subsidies. Now, quick pushback here against Steve Bannon. The radical free trade that he's talking about is the general case for free trade, which is that free trade is a unilateral argument you should engage in free trade regardless of what your trading partners do, whether they subsidize or start dumping goods. But putting this aside, what are the acts of aggression from the Chinese that Trump's tariffs are trying to address? Well, there are actually seven of them. The first of those is cyber espionage. Here's Curtis Ellis, a senior policy advisor in Trump's 2016 presidential campaign. You have the cyber espionage, the People's Liberation Army of the People's Republic of China has been systematically 
hacking into government computers, industrial computers, our, our industry, our companies, and our military computers, grabbing uh, personal information on millions of Americans, trade secrets, and military secrets. Right. The second is intellectual property theft. Back to Kurt Alice. What they can't steal, they put a gun to the head, a metaphorical gun to the head of American businesses and say, <clears throat> as the price of doing business in China, you have to hand over your blueprints and your trade secrets. You'll form a joint venture with a majority Chinese owner, a partner, a majority owned by the Chinese partner, and you will give this joint venture all of your blueprints and plans and technology. And uh, American businessmen uh, naively uh, think this is a good idea. Just, it sounds utterly insane. Why would people ever do this? Right? I know. <laughs> they say, oh, there's a billion and a half Chinese consumers. And uh, they, 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 get, they see dollar signs in their eyes and they get blinded by the gold. So it's more basically that they're afraid that someone else will get in there and, and do the deal if right. they don't do the deal. Yeah, that's right. right. Okay. Uh, again, I mean, this... Uh, is short-term thinking versus long-term thinking. Right. Short-term, oh, I want to get that money right now. Might right now. What happens in the long term is the Chinese partner, which uh, the partner <laughs> takes those blueprints, takes those trade secrets, and sets up an outside company, which then goes in direct competition uh, using that technology right. and drives this partnership and drives the foreign business out of business because there's now a Chinese competitor wholly owned by the Chinese. Now, the idea that the Chinese have been committing intellectual property theft is pretty well documented. The HBO series Silicon Valley does a bit on this. What just happened? Did he say? Oh. Yeah, well, he said that right after he bailed on us, he went out and made a deal with our competitor. But we don't have any competitors. Richard? Fucking Jin Yang. I'm gonna tear him a new asshole. It wasn't enough to do new Snapchat or new Expedia. He had to do new Pipe Pipe or two. Where did he get our code? He's always stealing snacks from the office. He could have lifted it from anywhere. I guess that's what happened to my lavender shoes. There's also a joke going around regarding all of this, which is... How far behind is China's tech sector compared to the states? 12 hours. So there is this idea that Chinese IP theft is so rampant that as soon as American tech workers go home and then wake up the next morning, their Chinese competitors have already copied everything they did the, the day before. Anyway, the third form of direct aggression from the Chinese that the US is trying to address follows from the second, which is a lack of intellectual property recognition. Back to our mate, Curtis Ellis. Remember, communism uh, is, negates private property. Right. And so the Chinese Communist Party and their ideology really doesn't recognize private intellectual property any more than it recognizes private real property. So your patents, your ideas, your copyrights, meaningless. And they feel completely uh, at ease stealing them, counterfeiting them, ripping them off. This is costing American companies hundreds of billions of dollars a year. Thanks again, Curtis. Now, the fourth is currency manipulation, the alleged practice of the Chinese government interfering with their currency to keep it artificially low in order to stimulate exports. Now, this is a big, big point, so I'll have to flesh this out a little bit later on. The fifth and sixth are basically the same point. The first of those being the fact that the Chinese have state-owned enterprises. And the second point from that being that the Chinese government have been using these state-owned enterprises to drive out foreign competition within China. Curtis, you're up again. The state-owned enterprises, the, the government of China owns uh, and subsidizes companies. They own companies and they provide these producers, these companies with direct subsidies in the form of free money, free energy, low or no interest loans, uh, land, because as I said earlier, they don't recognize private property. So they'll just take somebody's land and give it to a company and build a factory 
and say, okay, now operate the factory there. And you know, so now, and, and these are not market free market principles, right. but these state owned enterprises are now in competition with companies, American companies, foreign companies right. that do operate on free market principles. Obviously, they have an advantage. Right. And these state owned enterprises are producing goods that are then dumped at below market value inside the United States and on the world market. And they are driving private enterprise out of business. They're driving companies that operate according to free market value, free market principles out of business because they've got all these heavy subsidies and advantages. Right. And the seventh is probably the most interesting, in my opinion, because it isn't really about trade, but it's about fentanyl production within China. Back to our main man, Curtis Ellis. China is the source and the world's major producer of fentanyl, which is opiate, a powerful synthetic heroin, which is chemically concocted in laboratories. No poppies, no poppy fields right. involved. This comes directly out of factories in China, and it's shipped here. And it's so potent and so strong and so concentrated in an envelope, you could an envelope would contain enough to kill a, a, a train load of people. This is being shipped into the United States now. It's so very easy to smuggle, basically. Very easy yeah. to smuggle. Uh, China has this total surveillance technology. They track facial recognition. They know where everybody's going. They track everything on the internet. They know who's buying what, who's selling what. But for some reason, they can't seem to locate these factories that are producing this poison, which is killing mil uh, tens of thousands Big of Americans. Part of this opioid crisis that America's exactly. facing right now. And yeah. the opioid crisis happens to be centered in the very states that used to have industries and jobs and factories that are now in China. Terrible irony, I yeah. guess. Or this is uh, the new opium war, I've called it. And uh, look, China was subjected to this more than 100 years ago. It was disgusting. It was horrible. The British crown uh, created the opium trade uh, to subjugate China. And they've learned their history well. And the Chinese Communist Party has now turned the tables and using this form of, really it's a form of chemical warfare against the American body politic to dis dispirit and humiliate and discourage and depress the American population. All righty, that was a big bomb, the new opium war. Let that one sink in. So this is the first glimpse into the fact that the trade war might be a disguise for something else that's been going on, but we'll have to touch on these points a bit later on. So that wraps up the seven forms of direct aggression committed by the Chinese, which the US tariffs are designed to address. Now, for China's part, they've agreed to do better when it comes to intellectual property enforcement and to also increase their purchase of US goods. But if U.S. companies are going to voluntarily give over their intellectual property, they won't stop it. And it doesn't see itself as manipulating its currency. It has no business in engaging in a currency war. But you might be wondering, like others have, why is a trade war necessary? I mean, if the Chinese have been committing trade violations, why not take this up with the WTO where these sorts of disputes are meant to be handled? Well, the truth is that America and other countries have been taking these disputes to the WTO. President Obama likened China's trade practices to elbowing your opponents on a basketball court. But the thing is, there are a few problems with the WTO. First is that WTO rulings are retrospective. So if the court decides against China, China will comply with this ruling, but this doesn't do anything to address past harm. The second problem with the WTO is that it's ill-equipped to deal with China's opaque system and its widely used practice of state-owned enterprises. So as we heard before, the Chinese government engages in a practice of owning some of their companies, and it's believed that they subsidize these companies in the form of cheap rent, cheap interest on their loans, and other things of that nature, which naturally give them an advantage over their competitors. Now, there's this concept in international trade law 
that allows you to impose trade restrictions on a company when you believe they're doing the same to you. But there's a problem. There was a recent WTO ruling which showed simply showing Chinese government ownership in a company isn't conclusive proof of trade protection. Instead, you need much more conclusive evidence that they are genuinely subsidizing that company to an extent that justifies your countervailing measures against them. But they've set the bar so high that companies within the US and other countries around the world have simply stopped taking the Chinese to court on this point. So this is effectively given the Chinese government free license to subsidize companies without the repercussions of countries imposing countervailing trade protection measures against China. No one would say that's fair, right? The third problem with the WTO is that even its advocates, people like Paul Bluestein, can see that it doesn't guarantee free trade, but only pretty free trade. For example, if you take a look at the average tariff level around the world, you'll find a huge discrepancy. According to the US Council of Economic Advisors, the average tariff level in the United States is 3%. That's 4.1% in Canada, 5% in the EU, 10% in China, 13.9% in Korea, I think it's 11% in India. And so you get a sense that the US has a much lower tariff level compared to the rest of the world. And someone like Trump would say, how is that free trade? Now, the fourth problem with the WTO is more of a practical one, which Trump has just brazenly stopped reappointing judges to the WTO appellate body, which people believe will undermine its ability to function, at least temporarily, as it sorts out these issues. Now, some believe that this could potentially be the beginning of the end for the WTO. So those are some problems with the WTO, But another reason why Trump started this trade war is because he loves negotiating. Famously, he wrote the book The Art of the Deal, which is all about cutting the best deal possible. Now, as a result of that, Trump believes that he can get much better deals for the states by engaging in bilateral agreements with countries as opposed to multilateral agreements. Trump also takes the view that the tit-for-tat retaliation in the trade war will hurt China more than it will hurt the US. And that's because the Chinese only buy 8% of US exports, whereas the US buys 25% of Chinese exports. But China also has some ammunition. For example, President Xi can simply wait it out. He doesn't have to face an election like Trump does, so it's a long game for him. China also owns 5% of US national debt, which is more than any other country. So if it really wanted to, it could just sell all the debt on the market and increase interest rates, making it more difficult for the US to finance its obligations. Although by doing so, China would be shooting itself in the foot because it relies on the US. China could also devalue its currency in response to Trump's tariffs, as it did in August 2019. Which brings me to a big point, which is currency manipulation. So we know that one of the seven acts of Chinese aggression that the US is trying to address is the alleged practice of the Chinese setting its currency artificially low in order to stimulate its exports. First off, if true, if the Chinese were manipulating their currency, how on earth would would they do it? Now, I'm sorry if this now sounds like a university finance exam, but it's a really big point, so I have to underscore it. So we know that the US buys more from China than China buys from the US, right? It's the trade deficit. Now, because of this, a lot of Chinese exporters have a lot of US dollars, but US dollars are meaningless to them. They live in China, their workers live in China, they need yuan. So what they need to do is they need to take these US dollars and convert them for yuan. And if they were to do that, they would be bidding up the price of yuan 
and selling US dollars onto the market, which increases the supply of US dollars, which should decrease the value of its currency, and it should appreciate the value of the yuan. But that's only how it would work if their currency operated according to market principles. But it doesn't work that way in China. The Chinese government, or the CCP, manages its currency through what's called an adjustable peg. Basically, it picks a value relative to the US dollar for a given period of time, and then it just allows its currency to fluctuate within a 2% band. But in order to achieve this, the CCP needs to buy all those US dollars from the Chinese importers in exchange for yuan. So what that means is the CCP accumulates lots of foreign reserves, including US dollars. But what this also does is creates a scarcity for US dollars, which increases the value of the US dollar and keeps the yuan lower than what it would be otherwise. And so the fear is that through this process, the Chinese government have kept its currency artificially low in order to stimulate exports and have kept the US dollar artificially high, which has hurt US exporters. Now, the common Chinese response is that they keep their currency valued according to market fundamentals, but there's no way we can honestly know this because their currency isn't a free-floating currency. And so the only way we would truly know this is if they allowed their currency to float. And this is something that they haven't done. Okay, now that was a pretty heavy dose of international finance and economics. It was hurting my head there. Um, So congrats on getting through. Basically, the takeaway of all of this is that the Chinese government could be manipulating its currency and it does this because its currency isn't a free-floating exchange rate like other major currencies out the world, like the US dollar, the Australian dollar, the euro, etc. Okay, now that we know technically how the Chinese government would do this, why is this a big point? Well, it's a big point because if true, if the Chinese consciously undervalues its currency in order to boost its exports, then Donald Trump is absolutely right to take the Chinese to task on this. Why? Because a lot of the free trade argument is based on the assumption that the two countries have free-floating exchange rates. Let's take a listen to the economist Milton Friedman. The key, the reason why people are so mixed up, in my opinion, about free trade, there are two reasons. One is the propaganda from the producers. But the other is that they don't recognize the role of a floating exchange rate. As, a, as something, suppose for a moment, uh, in the vision that people give, that everything in Japan was cheaper than everything in the United States. Okay? And so we want to buy all of Japan. They're willing to sell us. And they get dollars. But they don't want to buy anything in the United States because we're all too expensive. What are they going to do with those dollars? They're going to try to buy yen. How can they buy yen? Only by offering a better price for yen. But as they offer a better price for yen, the Japanese goods get more expensive and the U.S. goods get less expensive. You can't compare costs between countries. The costs here are in dollars, the costs there are in yen. And which is cheaper depends on what the exchange rate is. And the exchange rate balances uh, moves in such a way as to uh, uh, make sure that everybody who wants to get dollars can get them, everybody who wants to get yens can get them. But what if Friedman and other economists are missing the fact that this trading partner, not Japan, as we heard in the example, but China, what if they don't have a free-floating exchange rate? In other words, it's all well and good to say that trade imbalances will be corrected through the operation of free-floating exchange rates, but what if your biggest trading partner is a country like China that has a exchange rate that doesn't operate according to market principles. Now, the retort to this might be is that, again, it's a great thing that we can buy goods from other countries more cheaply, even if they did artificially devalue it. And the second point would be, it would be the interest of the Chinese people to be devaluing your currency because the Chinese people own that currency. And if it's devalued, 
that means that their imports are going to be more expensive than them, what they would have been otherwise. But let's just assume that, yes, they have manipulated their currency. Then, again, this is a huge point because it also explains why, if you think back, the trade deficit with China could be so artificially large. And it could also potentially explain the strange allocation of capital around the world. Here's billionaire entrepreneur and tech investor Peter Thiel. In theory, in a world of Ricardo and, um, and rational actors and everyone being treated the same, we should have free trade. Everyone will be better off. It, it all sort of makes, makes sense. And yet, I think even if you look at this planet from outer space, you can tell that we are um, incredibly far from a functioning free trade regime. You know, the U.S. exports $100 billion a year to China. We import $500 billion a year. And in a sort of in a globalizing world, you'd expect convergence. You would expect um, the capital to flow to the higher growth regions. You would not expect Chinese peasants to be saving money to invest in low-yielding U.S. government bonds. And the fact that the money is flowing uphill tells you that uh, something is insanely wrong with, with the entire trade picture. And it's, it's probably massively overdetermined. Okay, so the point is that in a globalizing world, you'd expect capital go, to go downhill to poor emerging markets rather than uphill to mature developed economies with lower growth rates. Now, I understand that this is the theory but I don't think it necessarily makes sense for this to hold in all cases. Firstly, there could be great investment opportunities in the States, think investing in companies like Google and Amazon, which necessitates capital to flow uphill. The second point is that maybe the reason why capital isn't going downhill to China is because they don't have a fully developed banking and financial sector that can cope with all that foreign investment. Maybe there's a lack of transparency as to what exactly goes on when your money gets put in China, and that could naturally just scare off investors and force people to invest in uphill in countries like the US. Now, the third point is I'm going to use Peter Thiel against Peter Thiel here. In his book, Zero to One, he makes the point that the Chinese are definite pessimists. And so if you're a pessimist, this would mean that you would have a higher savings rate compared to your investment rates. And then, therefore, it explains why capital is going uphill. And the last reason is the fact that capital is going uphill maybe signifies that there's something wrong with the Chinese economy. Maybe it's built on a house of cards, and this is something that investors are aware of. But admittedly, even economists admit that there's something unusual about how large China's savings rate is compared to the rest of the world. They assume that there must be some government intervention going on that had, has allowed this to occur. Now, the one clear explanation for this is that, as we just heard, the Chinese manage their currency through an adjustable peg, so it has a stockpile of foreign reserves. It has to do something with these foreign reserves, so it invests in a risk-free asset like US bonds. But there are also some other theories being thrown around. The most interesting one that completely blew me away when I read it is based on the one-child policy that China famously had. And so what that did is it increased the male-to-female birth ratio, which in turn increased the competition in the marriage market. Now, this led Chinese households with one male child to increase their savings and invest more of that money into real estate in order to increase their son's prospects of marriage. Now, if true, this is absolutely hilarious. Imagine if the whole issue of a trade imbalance between US and China was due to Chinese families buying baller mansions for their son in order to increase his chances of getting a wife. I think that's hilarious to think about, but it could be true. It's just one of, one of the theories that people are making. Okay, we just took a look at the seven forms of Chinese aggression that Trump's tariffs are in place to address. The biggest of those, in my opinion, is currency manipulation. And we also took a look at why Trump didn't take the dispute to the WTO, but instead engaged in his trade war. But let's shift gears for a minute. What if 
this whole trade war is simply a disguise for something deeper? What if it's concealing that this is a fight between two heavyweight nations? Some have called it the new Cold War, others just a culture war. But however you want to phrase it, it's fascinating to see it play out in real time. Here's Steve Bannon again. China's been running an economic war against the industrial democracies for now 20 years. And eventually, when the companies, as Tom laid out in his op-ed piece this week, when the companies stopped making money, people realized with Made in China 2025, One Belt, One Road, and Huawei's 5G rollout, this is a, a master plan to become an economic hegemon. This is why that 175 to 200 page contract wasn't really about the trade aspects of it. It really wasn't about how many soybeans they're going to buy, etc. The fundamental parts were to go into these deep verticals of state capitalism and demand uh, transparency and accountability, to demand monitoring and enforcement. And that's why when the Chinese finally woke up, after nine months of negotiating with President Trump and Bob Lighthizer, they refused and basically walked away from the deal because they understood that they've been running an economic war in this, that this is not a trade deal. This is a truce and an economic war, an armistice, so to speak, and that they weren't prepared to do it. And I think you've seen over the last 48 hours what their response has been to trying to jack up the hypernationalism. But as Tom Friedman ended his column, this is not a front page business story. This is history in real time. It's the most significant thing that any president could possibly do. This is cuts to the core of what the United States is going to be uh, in the future and what our relation, our geostrategic relationship is going to be with uh, China. All right. There's a lot to unpack here. I don't know why I keep using that word unpack. It makes me sound like a gender studies professor. But anyway, a bit of context. So we know that the Chinese and the West run completely different systems. The West is mainly full of liberal democracies, whereas the Chinese run an authoritarian state-managed capitalist system. I think that's the best way to describe it. So ever since China joined the WTO in 2001, the hope was that as China would continue to liberalize its economy, it would eventually get the ball rolling on democracy as well. But almost 20 years on, this hasn't happened. The Chinese government, or the CCP, still restricts the flow of information and their media is effectively state-run. In 2018, President Xi amended the constitution to remove the two-term limit, effectively allowing him to remain in power for life. There's also China's social credit system, which allows the CCP to monitor the behavior of its population. And there's also Made in China 2025, which is an extremely ambitious five-year plan where the Chinese seek dominance in global dominance in several industries, including AI and robotics. You might be thinking, so what? Who cares? That's China's business. What's it to the US and the rest of the Western world? Well, it's a problem if China increasingly uses its influence to interfere with democracies around the world. For example, as Steve Bannon mentioned before, there's the use of the 5G network and Huawei to gain access to your data, which is why countries like Australia and the US have banned the sale of Huawei. We saw it in the NBA scandal in 2019, where a simple tweet from the GM of the Houston Rockets in support of Hong Kong protesters infuriated the Chinese government. Now, this pitted the interest of the Chinese market for the NBA against the freedom of speech for NBA players, coaches, and administrators. And obviously related to this are the issues in Hong Kong, with protesters claiming that the Chinese government is failing to honor its promise of one country, two systems. But it's not only meddling in Hong Kong, but also in other countries around the world, for example, Australia recently passed laws restricting Chinese foreign investment. Then there's the Belt and Road Initiative, which is an ambitious infrastructure project that builds roads, port, rail, bridges, and other infrastructure around the world, with critics saying that it gives the CCP increasing influence on the world stage. Then we have China's aggressive territorial claims in the South China Sea, 
which are in clear violation of international law, which says China has no business being there. Then if all of those examples didn't give you enough of a headache, there's the issue of North Korea, with whom China is a close ally. Now, it's believed that China could greatly assist with efforts to denuclearize North Korea, but it's believed that they're withholding assistance in order to secure a better trade deal. And then there's fentanyl production, which critics believe China, even though they would be able to stop it if they wanted to, have been deliberately allowing it to occur in an effort to dispirit Westerners in a move that's been described as the reverse of the opium wars. And an even more controversial, more populist take on events is that the Chinese have been deliberately deindustrializing the West with the help of American elites in order to gain the upper hand. Here's Steve Bannon again. People in the United States have to understand one thing. The Chinese look at us as a tributary state to them. And let me explain that. China's been around for 4,000 years, Mm -hmm. right? They've had good runs and they've had bad runs. Okay, but one thing they know and the reason they're still organized as a nation over 4000 years, right? They know how to handle allies and they know how to handle bad guys. Okay? Now what they've done is they got this system called barbarian management. And they know how to manage barbarians. The way they manage the barbarians is they take the leaders of the barbarians and they give them a taste of the good life. And you're going to be you're going to be something special. You're going to get a special deal. Now, what happens back into the tributary state is whatever happens. That's your problem. Right. Okay? So you're going to be, in the United States, what they have done for 25 and 30 years is played us as a barbarian state, barbarian management. Okay? They incentivize our elites, and our elites deindustrialize, particularly the upper Midwest of this country. It's the reason Donald Trump's president. Mm-hmm. Your audience should understand one thing that's important is that, you know, J.D. Vance, the great guy from Yale who wrote Hillbilly Elegies is the best sociological study of the Trump voter. Mm. And it was J.D. Vance who told me, says, hey, those studies that come out of MIT and Harvard show that there's a direct correlation between the factories that left for China, the jobs that left with them, and the opioid crisis. Because this is not about tariffs. It's actually logic. It's not about tariffs. What this is about is human dignity and self-worth. Those yeah. factories went. Wall Street made the money. The corporations benefit from it for lower costs. Yeah. And devil catch the hindmost on the workers. And so this is what Trump is kind of totally reversed. Now, what China sees us as is we're a tributary state. We send them natural resources, soybeans, beef, cattle, uh, Boeing Airlines and Apple products. Oh, excuse me. We don't send Boeing Airlines and Apple products. You know why? Because they forced Boeing to do a joint venture and they forced Apple to make the products over there. So all we, we're Jamestown to their Great Britain. Mm. Now, this is definitely a populist take on events. If true, then this would sync up with a classic Chinese military strategy, which is that the best general defeats the enemy without firing a shot. I personally find it hard to believe in that conspiracy and imputing sinister intent to a broad group like elites. Who exactly are these elites? If it's just Wall Street bankers, then... Is Steve Bannon also one of those complicit elites as he was an investment banker for Goldman Sachs many years ago? I think it's much more likely that the CCP have their own agenda to make China as powerful as possible. And independently of that, Wall Street have tried to make money. And one way that it makes money is by doing business with Chinese investment. Okay, but putting all of this aside, you could still be thinking... Yeah, even if China has begun increasing its influence on the West, this is just an inevitable part about China becoming one of the world's biggest economies. Why should we necessarily be concerned or worried about this? One reason why you might be concerned is if this country, China, has a different set of values that it wants to impose on you, values that you don't share. Let's take a listen to our old mate, Curtis Alice, again. This is not just a trade war. This is a war of values. This is a conflict of ideologies. Right. What's at stake here is not simply cheaper TVs or cheaper T-shirts or everyday low prices at the department store. What we're witnessing is a contest over who will own the future and over the continued existence of American ideals, what we'd call Western ideals, 
freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, private property, uh, individual rights. Because the Chinese Communist Party does not believe in individual rights. They believe in collective wisdom or collective leadership or obedience and authority. They don't believe in private property. Freedom of speech extends only if you speak what we deem to be proper speech. Politically correct speech. Politically correct speech, yes. Thank you. Freedom of religion, no such thing. Ask the Uyghurs, ask the Christians, ask the Tibetans, ask the Buddhists, ask, uh, it's not a religion, but ask the Falun Gong if you're allowed to follow your conscience. Uh, the it's a, Chinese communism, uh, socialism with a Chinese characteristic, is still an atheistic philosophy, a materialistic philosophy. They don't believe in any higher spiritual dimension. Um, we do here in the in the West and in, in the United States. Will America continue to exist? Will all of these ideals that I just went through continue to exist? A world that is where the supreme power, where the top power is the Chinese Communist Party will be a very different world than the world we live in. Censorship will be the norm. Uh, direction, uh, everything will be directed by a central authority. So now, the counter to all of this is it's so naive to think that the United States, as well as other countries throughout the West, are so innocent that they haven't tried to do something similar to China and to other countries around the world. This is absolutely true, but in my personal opinion, it's a battle of values. Do you believe in Western values of openness, freedom, and democracy, even an attempt at democracy, or would you be happy to cede this ground to whatever it is that the CCP is trying to install? Now, this is a much deeper debate that probably deserves another episode, but it's fascinating to see history unfold as we speak. All right, that's everything. So what do you think? Is the trade war justified or is it simply a road to no end? And what do you make of the new Cold War that's playing out? If you're a YouTuber, make sure you let me know in the comments below. And that's everything for this time. I'll see you next episode. I think they're all insane. If you got value from this episode, please do me a quick favor. First, hit subscribe. And second, leave a five-star review if you're podcasting, or hit the like button and the notification bell if you're YouTubing. There. Too easy. See you next time.